Christ. And so glad that you're here today with us to worship God and to give him even more thanks and praise because he deserves unlimited thanks and praise. And so the service is going to be a little different today. We are beginning our Advent season, so uh, we will have uh, begin our Advent readings this week. That is a, a nice uh, addition to our service. And then also uh, we have a special testimony halfway through the service today of one of our members. And so he's going to come up and share his testimony during the children's sermon time. So children, that doesn't mean you can just tune out because it's not a kid's sermon. I think you'll enjoy hearing um, the testimony of Mr. Larry Cobbs. Um, got a couple of announcements to make here today as well. Um, there's some on the back of your bulletin you can read. Sharon Dykstra says, thank you for all of the birthday wishes. She was very blessed by those. And so you can see her little note of thanks there. And then I also have just a kind of a praise the Lord prayer update for Dorothy Hayden who's, I believe Betty said it was her daughter who described her as a tough old bird. <laughs> she, Dorothy made it home for Thanksgiving. And uh, even though she's uh, still dealing with congestive heart failure, she seems to be doing pretty well. And so she just says, thank you for your prayers for Dorothy. And so I want to encourage you. The Lord is at work there as well in Dorothy. Um, want to remind the kids, the Christmas shop opens today after church. So... Um, just calmly walk downstairs and <laughs> head down to the old library and you'll see an amazing shop that has been put together just for you and kids you can shop there and you don't have to spend money it's amazing so uh, enjoy that and take part in that after church today also, I want just to remind you, there is a, a, going to be a ladies' Christmas gathering. There's not a lot of detail in the bulletin here, but I saw there are sheets on the table in the narthex right by the stairs. And Carrie, you're going to say something? It, the clipboard's actually being passed around right now. Oh, there's a clipboard going around. So good. You can sign up for that. Um, that's going to be December 8th, I believe, I saw on that. Also want to encourage you just to save a couple dates here that are on here. December 11th, Christmas caroling, 3 p.m. That's always a blessed time to go out and just uh, sing Christmas carols. And then the 18th is our Sunday school Christmas program. And so I want to encourage you in that as well. As far as uh, prayer requests go this morning, and uh, did receive a note this morning that Michael Schultz is going to be on his way back home starting today. They're going to try and make it in about two days, journeying back from Colorado. Of course, he still has a lot of recovery to do with the injuries from the skiing accident. And so um, we ask for your continued prayer for them and prayer for this trip, that it would be safe and that they would, um, that he would have comfort, I think, on the ride, because it, I think it could be quite uncomfortable to ride in a car after all those injuries. And so just pray for his comfort and ease in that as well. Is there anything else I might be missing this morning, announcement-wise? Gail. You said Scotty Cook? Okay. So we can certainly be praying for Scotty Cook and uh, for Michael. And, of course, we want to pray for um, our brother Daryl Hoksh as well and Cheryl as they're um, trying to work out the scheduling for his next surgery. He, he did test positive for COVID, so he wasn't able to go in for his um, heart operation. And so they're trying to get that rescheduled for a little later in December. And so just pray for all of those situations as well. But as we lead into worship this morning, I'd like to invite the Bill and Amber Lee Reese family up. And they're going to do our Advent reading today and lead us into worship.
prophecy a hope candle. Prophecy is God revealing his will to his people, which brings great hope and joy to all mankind. Beginning as soon as the first sin was committed, God began revealing his plan to send a savior to redeem his people, telling the serpent in the garden that someday the descendant of Eve would crush your head and you will strike his heel. This promise would have brought great hope and wonder to the ears of Adam and Eve as they were losing everything. And yet God was promising to send a Messiah to fix what they had broken. This was good news indeed. Later in history, God had to correct his people Israel to worship idols. So God allowed them to be given captive and sent to a fallen land called Babylon. Here they will be poor, lonely, and outcast. Just like he did with it was Adam and Eve, Ju and just like a mom and dad hugs their child when they have to punish them. When the prophet Isaiah was telling God's people about the, their punishment for their sins, God also gave Isaiah a prophecy of hope so that his people would know that he still loved them and would help them. That's right. God said through Isaiah, the people who have walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone for to us. A child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This indeed was a message of hope, a prophecy that God would always love his people and that he was going to send a savior to rescue them. Jesus wouldn't be born for hundreds of years and yet God was giving them a promise they could count on, a promise of redemption. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you again that we have a reminder of the great promises that you've given us and that we'll be able to see the fulfillment of that promise in the sending of your son, Jesus Christ. I ask that you continue to remind us that as we enter this season. I ask that you continue to look to the future promise of your second coming and our great redemption. These things I pray in your name. Amen. Well, I'd invite you to stand. And uh, if you want to grab the hymnal that's in front of you, uh, we're going to turn to page number 122. There's a reading there that I'd like to do together. I'll read the first portion as the worship leader, and then you guys can join in on the last phrase there. And then our first two songs we're going to do kind of as a medley. So the first two songs we're going to sing the first two verses um, of each one. So you can just stay right there in your hymnal. Who shall come in the fullness of time to gladden the hearts of men? Who shall bring new joy to the world and the poor and lonely defend? Who shall come on a cold winter's night when the world is hushed and still? Only the silent stars keep watch as the promise is fulfilled. Just as a child newly born, he shall come to a stable rough with sod. Tis gentle Jesus, Prince of Peace, the blessed Son of God. We await him with reverent hearts. O come, Lord Jesus, come.
were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. And as we're about to sing, angels with flaming tongues above praised his birth. Fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, all my songs of loudest praise. go to God in prayer as each one of us silently confesses our sins to him. Hear God's assurance of pardon from John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we enter this Christmas season, help us to remember the real reason for the season, you sending your Son into this world. As we celebrate your birth, may we, like the angels, glorify and praise you and tell others what you have done for us. May we be like Mary and treasure and ponder in our hearts what your coming down to earth means to us, salvation, forgiveness of sin, eternal life. And Lord, we just pray that you'll hear our petitions. There are many. Lord, we pray for those that are recovering from surgery or procedures or for illnesses. We pray that you'll just continue to heal them and give them strength. We pray for those that are waiting for surgeries. And we just pray that you will uh, comfort them. pray that you'll calm their anxieties. We pray for Glenn Lindert's brother-in-law, Mike, who's battling with cancer and now has COVID. We pray that you will heal him, be with his wife, Sandy. Lord, we pray for Michael Schultz and his family as they're heading back to Wisconsin. We just pray that you'll give them traveling blessings. We pray that you'll be with Michael, give him comfort as he rides in the vehicles home, and we just pray that you'll continue to heal him. 
Lord, we pray for Dorothy Hayden. We thank you for the good news about her, that she was able to be home for Thanksgiving. We just pray that you'll continue to be with her as she deals with congestive heart failure. Lord, we just pray, too, for the people that will be traveling home after spending time with family or hunting, and pray that you'll keep them safe. We pray for our snowbirds in this church as they will be heading south soon. We pray that you'll give them traveling blessings as they travel and be with us as they are separated from us. Lord, we also want to pray that you'll be with us as we enter another flu season. We pray that you'll keep us healthy and and um, keep us from sickness, if you can be here well. We also want to pray that you'll be with Scotty Cook, the gentleman that comes to the car show every year. We just uh, pray that you'll be with him. We pray that you would give him more time with his family as he requested, if you can be here well. And Lord, we pray now that you'll be with Michael as he brings the message to us from your word. We pray that you'll help us to apply your words to our life. And, and as we go into... The world this week, we pray that um, you would just be with us at work, at school, in our neighborhoods. We pray that others may be able to see you and us. We ask all this in your name. Amen. When our family gathers together for Thanksgiving, we do that kind of traditional, what are you thankful for? And the circle keeps getting bigger and bigger, so sometimes it takes longer and longer and longer. But as you're waiting for your turn to come, it does give you a chance to pause and think back over the year, and what am I thankful for? How has God blessed me? And um, as we go into this season of Advent and Thanksgiving, where we're, we're thinking about two different things, we're still thinking about how God has blessed us, right? And the ultimate way that he could bless us was by sending his son down to earth. But he didn't He didn't just send his son down and go, oh yeah, it's okay, I'm God, I'll take care of it all. He sent his son that was sitting with him in glory down to be amongst us. And he sent him down in just a rude way into this mud stall, cattle stall. That's how he came into the earth. And then he was among us who constantly failed him, let him down, put him down, kicked him, spit him, and crucified him. But we can be so thankful and so blessed that because of that, out of that came the cross. And without the cross, flashing forward to Easter, Christmas means nothing. So as you pause and think about what you're thankful for this time of year, be thankful for that little baby. And yet be thankful for that King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who came down out of glory down here to bless us. So I'm just going to read a little bit out of Romans here. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life?
like to invite the ushers forward this morning. Lord Jesus, we do give you thanks for the blessings that you pour out on us. And Lord, we pray that you take these gifts and these tithes and offerings, Lord Jesus, and that you would bless them and multiply them and use them to further your kingdom. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. just want to invite uh, Larry Cobbs forward and uh, John, and Larry's going to be uh, just sharing a testimony here, and one of his um, biggest struggles is public speaking. Come on up, Larry, and, uh, and John, and so his best friend, John, has uh, decided to help him through uh, this, this ordeal today, and Larry's just going to share with us what the Lord has done in his life, and um, John's here to kind of help him along with that. So, uh, what prompted all of, all of this, Larry? I can see I'm already going to have trouble with this. Emotional. Um, five years ago, about, the Lord was calling me back. from backsliding, if you will. And I ended up at the door of this church. And I feel compelled, especially the last three years, to testify to the blessings that have happened in my life. 
many of you probably know or have heard or um, been aware of the last few months that uh, I've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. This was several months ago. <clears throat> and the Lord is blessing. The Lord is really blessing. And I want to thank, as I look out over my brothers and sisters, in Christ, there are some real prayer warriors in, in this group. Uh, I have been approached. By, I've got cards and letters, and I have been approached by brothers and sisters in this body. Send me letters and say they're praying for me. And I count the prayers of a righteous man more powerful than any doctor. What brought this to a head is I had a meeting. My last appointment with the oncologist was Wednesday. And he said, Larry, I've got news. I'm not going to say just right now what that news was, because I want to back up to the beginning. Praise the Lord. Lord, let this not be about me. But several months ago, <coughs> the Lord started orchestrating. I realize that now. Many of you know that um, I fell at work back in April. I fell hard, tripped on a pallet at work, and hit the cement very hard, bruised some ribs that hurt for a while, hit my face. Praise the Lord, it didn't break out teeth or anything. But the point is, someone at work helped me up. It didn't feel too bad, it hurt. I finished the day, this was 9.30 in the morning. When I went home that night, that leg, the left leg ballooned, <laughs> as you might expect. Two days later, my sister took me to Madison, to my health care provider, to the urgent care center. She had to drive me because I couldn't bend the knee and I was on crutches. And they took a picture of it, and my left kneecap was cracked. And right away, they sent me to an orthopedic and fitted it with a brace, and I was on crutches. In subsequent meetings with the, uh, uh, at that meeting, as a Medicare recipient, those of you in the room know that you are given a get well appointment every year to see how you're doing. <clears throat> and for four or five years, I was not given a prostate exam, and I never thought about it. And when I was with the orthopedic doctor, I made a suggestion, what can we do about the fact that I got to get up every hour at night? guys in the room you might identify with this. So right away almost he sent me to a urologist. He did the prostate exam. I could tell by his face this was not good. And within four or five weeks I was at the uh, urologist again and they started the, the imaging. There was never a biopsy taken. And they did the imaging. They called it nuclear. You know, they put a dye in your body and they put you in a machine and it tells you something and then they did a CAT scan. So within the process of about a month, um, that was done and accomplished been through many doctors doing that. So are you saying that your fall on your knee was the reason that I didn't think about it at the time, but I was so quick off crutches and the knee brace 
I'm sure many of you, I never came to church on crutches, so it was very hard. But I'm sure you all remember seeing me carrying a cane. Because when the crutches went away, I used the cane as a security blanket, if you will. Mm -hmm. Not always needing it, but having it there. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, when the imaging was done, I was at the oncologist for the first time, the uh, cancer doctor. And he says, Larry, you've got cancer. You got prostate cancer, and it's advanced. It's into your bones, and it's into your lymph nodes. So we can't take the prostate out. It wouldn't do any good. That's when I realized that the Lord had orchestrated that. Because that knee, his left knee with the broken kneecap, heals so fast. Even the ortho, not the orthodontist, the orthopedic doctor was amazed at how fast they took another picture sometime down the road that that knee had completely healed. And it's better now than it's ever been. Praise God. But now I have prostate cancer and probably advanced. They started a treatment right away. It's a hormone treatment. Um, the drug involved is, um, I've been on it for four months now. I've been on this regiment for four months. And praise the Lord, even the side effects, you all know from getting drugs from your doctor, the side effects list they give you looks like this. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing from the side effects other than an occasional hot flash. <laughs> But I asked, I said to the doctor, I've never had a hot flashes. I'm aware that ladies in menopause talk about hot flashes. So four or five hours after taking these drugs, I may experience a hot flash or two, but it's temporary. So other than that, I have no, um, nothing from the drugs. <clears throat> and, um, so I've been on, and this treatment is hor hormonal. And I, for that first meeting when he told me that, I said, Doc, he had told me he'd been an oncologist for 30 years. I said, Doc, you've seen men like me. And this condition, I said, what is the prog prognosis? What do you estimate? He said, Larry, I, estimate three to five years. My first response was, praise the Lord, I'm 80 years old and you're telling me that I can live three to five more years. Honest to God, that's the first thing out of my mouth. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so, what has happened? Like I said, I had a, um, meeting with the oncologist Wednesday, and he had, I have news, and I've been on this treatment, and they did a PSA prior to me going there, and I guess the PSA, Peter looked up, I don't really remember what PSA stands for, but many of you know it has something to do with checking things in the body. And I said to the doc before he said anything, I said, doc, does cancer hurt? <laughs> does it hurt? Because I feel nothing. If you weren't telling me I have cancer, I would never know it. Nothing hurts. Nothing is bothering me. He said, Larry, your cancer has stopped growing. He didn't say remission. He didn't say healed. He said, your cancer has stopped growing. The treatment is working. When he told me I had three to five years probably, and, and then he said, at the end of that three to five years, if you're still with us, you're going to have to choose between radiation or chemo <laughs> if you want to keep on going. 
I said, Doc, I'm not going to do that. If I live another three to five, I'm going home to be with the Lord. <laughs> I'm not going to go through that. But anyway, this revelation of God orchestrating and working in my life, I felt compelled to bring that to my brothers and sisters here, the body of Christ, and to give the Lord praise and worship for what he can and does do for us in our afflictions here in this life as we journey through this life to our heavenly home. <clears throat> yeah. And if, if you guys, we're going to cut it off here, but um, Larry has a lot more blessings that he would love to share with, with any one of you guys about his uh, returning to the Lord. And uh, just he's so grateful and thankful to every one of you guys who's come to him and told him that you're praying for him and all of your prayers. Again, um, you can... Feel free right. to talk to Larry at any time right. um, and ask him about the way that the Lord has blessed him. And he yeah. would love to encourage you with that. If we had another hour, I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to add something else about the Lord working in our lives. Um, three weeks ago, I, my daughter and my uh, granddaughter and her two children. <laughs> Somehow they accepted my invitation to attend church here with me. And they're not saved. Um, and they live in Lloyd Janesville area, not all that far away. And they did. And we agreed upon a date a month or so in advance. And it was um, October 30th. Okay. I have no idea what the message is going to be that day or what they would be exposed to. But um, at the last minute, my daughter called me up and they wanted to change the date till November 6th. Okay, that's fine. They're still coming. They were going to stay overnight. That has never happened. We've never done that. Um, anyway, she, um, my daughter, my granddaughter, and my two great I guess they would be my great-grandsons. I don't know. <laughs> Thinking about the genealogy. Anyway, Pastor Chuck's message on the 30th was, um, what, the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Okay, well and good. Not particularly a salvation message. But his message on the, <laughs> but his message on the 6th, the next Sunday, was... Every step of the way, Psalm 136. And if, <laughs> how the Lord is with us, every step of the way as we go through this life, that was such a strong, strong salvation message. Delivered <laughs> how anyone sat through that service. I told Chuck afterwards, the only thing missing was an altar call. And, and I know the Lord orchestrated that because we don't normally, Kathy Huberty, as that morning when Chuck was ready to get into the service, I, Kathy, because I remember her standing up and saying something, that she would be downstairs in the nursery. Now these two boys, these two great grandsons, four and eight years old, they don't go to church regularly at all. My, my, my family, my daughter, my granddaughter, don't go to church. But these boys have been exposed a little bit because their grandmother down there would take them to church once in a while. And when Kathy called for that back there, and I thank her so much for that, I thank the Lord for that. Those two boys left and went without even being asked to. And what that meant was the two adults, my family members, were able to sit through the service and absorb that salvation message. The seed was planted. A seed has been planted. And that happened to be the first Sunday of the month when we have the Lord's Supper. 
past very well, well explains the parameters around that. But at the end of the Lord's Supper, we sing the Lord's Prayer, which is one of the emotional, one of the most emotional things I think that we do here. Um, when you come to the crescendo, for thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. It always brings tears to my eyes to be praising the Lord that way. And I noticed my daughter standing beside me, had tears running down her face. Whether or not anything comes to this, only the Lord knows. Only the Lord can do anything about this. But the seed has been planted. Praise God. And uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I know there are a lot of people in this church, my brothers and sisters, and I'm looking at you. Um, we have health needs. We have all kinds of needs as we go through this life here on earth. And I'm just one of them. And I am not special. But I feel the Lord is blessed. Since I came into this group, I feel blessed by all of you. As I look out over this group, I see people that I have spent all kinds of time with personally. And you know who you are. I've prayed with you, sang with you, had parties with you, been at your house, you've been at my house. I didn't know any of you before I moved to this area. What do we have in common? We have the Lord. We have the Lord in common. And having the Lord in your life bridges everything, everything. Otherwise, we have very little in common among us other than our love of the Lord and his presence in our lives. Oh, I'm sorry. But I felt compelled when I got this news to share it. That's what was, that was the final thing that brought all this out to the front, because I thought about this, what being in this body of believers has meant to me in the last three to four years since I came here five years ago. And um, you are all a blessing. I consider you all my friends. And I want to mention the Waltons before I conclude this. I don't know how John and I bonded as much as we did. We spend, we have spent time together and some of the best times I remember, John, is you used to come almost every Saturday night and we would listen to a Bible study off the TV and talk, and talk about the Lord. And we are three generations apart. I'm 80 years old and you're 20 something. What is the connection? The connection is God. And I'm, I feel very close to, John is my best friend. His family is right behind. They have been such a blessing to me, probably because at the very beginning when I first came here, they were the first ones that I saw. Chuck has repeated this uh, more than once that when I walked, I checked out all, when the Lord was calling me back, I checked out all the churches in Partyville. I went to them. I have laughingly used the phrase when I visited them, I was the youngest one there. <laughs> well, that tells me <laughs> there were no young people, probably no future. And I, when I come, this was the last one I visited. This was in 2017 summer of 2017, when the Lord was calling me back from about 25, 30 years of backsliding. I became born again in the mid 70s when our family was splitting up. But anyway, I walked, when I come to the door back there, Chuck happened to be the greeter that day as it turned out. And when I said my name, I said, I come to see what the Lord has for me. I've been something to that effect. I don't remember the act. I've been backslidden for 30, 35 years. And uh, <laughs> that has surfaced that I said that frequently in conversation. But it's been very, very true. Um, this group of believers 
has been so open and loving and caring. And I so want to thank everyone that has prayed for me as we pray for others in this group that need God's touch for one reason or another. But you have prayed for me and helped me out. And like I said, uh, Chuck has asked me when I became a member, I met with the elders and I met Chuck, we have a group going now. What, what, what was your motivation? What brought you here? I said, right away I recognized God was here. The Lord was here. His message is preached, taught. The word of God is taught that his blood washed away our sins and made us as white as snow. Therefore, we are redeemed. It was brought to my attention very shortly that maybe a subject for what I'm about to say was Psalm 107, the very beginning. There is something about the redeemed and rejoice, rejoice. So that was the genesis or the inclination. I am telling my brothers and sisters in Christ how the Lord has affected my life. And I think the Lord wants us to do that aside from the being sent out into the world to preach the gospel wherever Jesus went and did what he did, spoke, taught, healed. People went and told. He either told them to go tell or they went on their own and told the world around them, this is what the Lord has done for me. Almost without exception in the Bible. Because he, then that is what happens. Was we are edified. We are strengthened, I believe. When we hear from others, the Lord working in their life. So I want to thank you all so much and thank the Waltons and thank, I sense in this group that there are some real prayer warriors, real prayer warriors. And uh, I want to thank you all. And like I said, that is the genesis of <laughs> coming here the day the Lord has led me to want to say this for two or three years. And the fact that apparently good news because when the doc said you've got cancer you know and I could have three to five years my thought was my god he could have said six weeks he could have said six months you know and it's going to be that many years and now it is on hold like I said it, this could go on there's an old saying that a lot of men die with cancer, but not a lot of men die of cancer. But mine was advanced. But he said it's not growing. He said prostate cancer cells feed on testosterone. So the treatment, the hormone treatment, it's used in breast cancer and prostate cancer, among other. It starves the cancer cells from eating. So that maybe that is what has happened. But I gave that to the Lord. I thought about what the doctor said for a few days. And I said, Lord, I, the Lord wants us to put our cares and burdens on him. And I accepted his peace more. I said, Lord, you can heal me of this, or you can let me take me home with this. I said, I'm ready to go now. Or if you leave me here, Help me to be involved in the harvest of souls. The Lord says the fields are white for harvest. If you leave me here, I will do my best, Lord, to help spread your word, be a missionary, evangelist for the harvest of souls before you come back and take your church out of this. Well, with, with that in mind, why don't we, we pray? Okay. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for Larry. Lord, and the blessing it is to hear about it. We, we praise you, Lord, and remember all the things that you've done for, for each of us. 
Lord, we ask that we would bring you glory in our lives. And Lord, I, I just want to pray again for Larry. Lord, we, we thank you for the blessing of the cancer that's it stopped growing and all the ways that you've worked in that. We ask, Lord, for your continued work in, in Larry's life, Lord, that you would use him more and more and that you would prolong his days. To your glory, amen. Thanks, John. Thanks, John, for whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory to God. Well, as they're being seated here, I just want to have you turn with me to Psalm 107, and that is essentially our message today is, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's what Larry has just done. And so I'm going to have you turn there with me. Um, this psalm is a, a psalm of celebration and a psalm of praise that was likely sung by the exiles upon their return back to um, Israel to their homeland and to Jerusalem to rebuild and to um, bring back the community that they once had and uh, thinking about them after 70 years of exile you start to think wow that's a long time probably not a lot of them remembered what it was like to worship in the temple in Jerusalem probably not a lot of them had experienced that most of them had never experienced probably owning their own land and providing for their own families, but rather just working in menial jobs or even in slave labor in exile. And so they're having great joy and thankfulness to God for bringing them back home at last. And so we're going to read this psalm together here. It's a long psalm, but uh, I think it's God's word, and it's the most important thing that will be said today. And so I'm going to read the, the entirety of it. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. And let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. 
and some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, and they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm to be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He, God, turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, we have heard the testimony of our brother Larry, and we've read this psalm of your deliverance for your people in many different circumstances. And Lord, we recognize this morning that you indeed have steadfast love for us that endures forever. And we want to cry out to you in thanks today, Lord. So help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like with you, um, you to go back with me in time, in the spirit of thanksgiving, to the early 1600s. It was at this time that a group called the Separatists began to separate themselves from the Church of England. They were tired of worshiping under the prescribed religion of the king and queen of England and instead wanted to worship God as commanded in the Bible. And so they began to separate, and they began to meet in secret. Of course, the governing house of bishops in England would send out spies, and they would find these secret congregations, and they would punish them, oftentimes by imprisoning them or beating them or fining them, and breaking up these meetings of Christians that were not worshiping in the state church. And so the separatists, they left England for Holland after many years of enduring this persecution. After they went to Holland, they enjoyed their religious freedom, but it wasn't too long before they realized there were other troubles there for them. They were very concerned about their young people being impacted by the rather morally loose Dutch society that they experienced in Leiden. They were afraid that that influence would draw their people, their young people, away from Christ. They also had the trouble of having given up their land and their possessions. And, and now instead of farming or providing for themselves in their own line of work, they were now finding themselves as employees and, and not even as landowners, but as tenants. And they realized, boy, this isn't really what we wanted either. And so they began to plan to make a trip to the new world. And of course, we know those separatists today as pilgrims. And they are part of our national heritage. And so the pilgrims began the trip to the new world. They wanted a new society with freedom to worship God in a way that the Bible commanded. And they also desired a holy society that would have God's morals as its cultural norms. That's what they were really seeking when they came here. 
course, they endured many hardships um, as they made their ocean voyage. It was late in the year. They didn't end up leaving until September because of the delays that they had along the way. And so it was a long, cold voyage across the Atlantic. It took them 65 days at sea to get here. And they were blown so far off course, they were going to land in Virginia. They landed up in Massachusetts. And it was November 9th. Winter was here. They had to begin right away preparing for winter, to try to make it through that season. And yet through all the troubles and all the hardships, the pilgrims routinely cried out to God in praise for what he had done for them, giving thanks for what he had done for them. You know, that first winter, they made it through the winter, but their entire population was 102 going into the winter, and when spring came, they were down to 53. They had had uh, a bout with a flu-like sickness, and um, it was so devastating that two or three people would die each day, and they would end up carrying them out at night so that the Indians wouldn't realize how weak their numbers were becoming. And yet, in the spring, God blessed them. He brought great blessings along. He brought two men, two English-speaking Indians, Samoset and Squanto. And they came, and they introduced themselves to the pilgrims, and they provided great services to them. Squanto, of course, knew all about farming and how to uh, grow crops, and he taught the pilgrims, and he helped to interpret with them with the other Indian tribes. And then Samoset, he helped negotiate peace treaties with the local tribes for them. And so they were a great help to them. And they gave God all the credit for that, providing these two men for them. And so by the fall of 1621, the pilgrims called for a feast, a Thanksgiving feast. And they invited their friends from the Indian tribes, and they feasted together, and they gave thanks to God for all that he had done for them. And they gave him praise and glory for three days. And I relate this story to you uh, because it's a story kind of similar to these four scenarios that the psalmist lays out here. Uh, The pilgrims went through a lot of troubles and a lot of hardship to come to this land and seeking um, a godly lifestyle and a godly society that they could be a part of. And um, this passage here really kind of goes through so many different ways of hardship that we can experience in life and that the pilgrims experienced and the exiles likely experienced as well. I think it's kind of summed up well in these last few verses here, 33 through 42, in which it says that God turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste, because of the evil of its inhabitants. And then on the other side, he turns a desert into pools of water and a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. And by his blessing, they multiply greatly. And he does not let their livestock diminish. And when they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it, and they are glad, and wickedness shuts its mouth. And so we're going to take our two points from this, um, these verses here, in that They kind of go against each other a little bit. They're almost paradoxes, so to speak. But they're that God is the one who brings people from prosperity down to poverty and from the mountaintop to rock bottom. And then it's also God who creates blessing out of barrenness and who lifts up the lowly to lavish blessing. And so we see those two things in these verses here, and we see them throughout this psalm, and that's where we're going to focus today. And of course, um, the concept that we want to get in mind, the main theme of this whole psalm, 
is that we would bless God and thank him and praise him for his wondrous works to the children of man. And so that will be our third and final point is that we must give thanks to God, our redeemer, um, because that's the center of this Psalms message, not only for the Israelites, but for you and me as well. So we'll start with the, the negative aspect of things here. God is the one who um, causes or brings about poverty out of prosperity. He can bring people down. He can bring nations down. He can bring individuals down from the mountain to rock bottom. There's a reason for that. You know, we often speak of God's sovereignty and and how he uses many different situations to show us our need for him. We think of even Larry with breaking his kneecap, and that was God's way of showing him this other um, thing that was much more serious, the cancer, and they were able to treat it. And so God's sovereignty is on display in all these four situations, and we're just going to run through them fairly quickly here. The first one is there are people who are wandering and they have no home. Not only that, but the land that they're wandering in is desert. And so they suffer from hunger and thirst, and in their very souls, they're giving up hope. They're truly experiencing poverty. They're finding themselves at rock bottom. They have no hope of finding refuge. And so what is their response? They cry out to God. They cry out to God. The next scenario we see here is of people in chains, imprisoned, even enduring beatings and being near death, again, at rock bottom. But this situation is a little bit different because we see that there's a reason for it, and that is their rebellion. It says they rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. They knew the very goodness of God, and yet they rejected his good words, his good instruction, his wisdom. And so their experience became one of hard labor and toil with no one to help them through it. It says this too was brought about for a reason. It says that God did it to bow their hearts down, to humble them, to make them to seek out and to cry out to him for mercy. And so we see the same result. People going through hardship maybe wasn't the cause of their own crying out to God for mercy, people going through hardship that is the consequence of their own sin, crying out to God for mercy. This third picture is another one of people who are afflicted. We're thinking sickness here and enduring through pain and sickness. Uh, Verse 18 even says that they were so sick they didn't want to eat and their sickness threatened their very lives. And so again, being down at the bottom where there's no hope. There's another reason for this one. He says the affliction here is caused by their iniquities or their sins. And so in this particular case, we know the psalmist is talking primarily about sickness as a result of our sin. Now we do know from scripture that Um, not all sickness is a result of sin. And so we have to recognize that as well and that God does redeem us from both sicknesses, okay? And when we cry out to him for mercy, which is what this sickness does, it causes these people to cry out to God for his mercy. The fourth scenario is a bit different. It speaks of those who went down to the sea and did business on the waters. They're just going about their work. I think like the average everyday American. They take great comfort in their skill and ability and knowing they have things under control. They have a schedule. They have a budget. They have um, a means of accomplishing everything in life. And they're just going through day by day, the daily grind. These people, they're not experiencing hardship yet. In fact, the next thing it says, it doesn't tell that they're experiencing hardship, but the next statement is, They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. God reveals himself to them by putting them in a place of hardship, by putting this storm in their path, because they're living in a a season of self-reliance. 
relying on their own skills and abilities and strength. And God is bringing this storm in. It says that he commands the storm to come and the waves were lifting the boat as high as heaven and plunging it to the depths when they felt like the tide was just going to close in over the top of them. They reeled and staggered and recognized they had no control over the situation. And so they cry out to God for his mercy. And sometimes it takes a revelation from God to help us to realize that we need a savior, a redeemer, and to cry out to him in our distress and weakness. And so we do indeed see here that God is one who can take people from living in a place of prosperity to living in poverty. He can take us from the mountaintop and allow us to reach rock bottom. Sometimes it's a direct result of our sin, and sometimes it's just a result of sin in general, that we live in a fallen world, a fallen world that causes suffering and pain and hardship. The point here is that no matter what type of suffering was experienced, the people cried out to God and he delivered them, and that is precisely the God who we have. He's a God who delivers and redeems. And so now we're going to look at God's response to man's suffering and weakness, and we're going to see the other side of that coin where God brings blessing out of barrenness, and he exalts the lowly and the lacking to being lavished with love. And so again, we'll look at these four um, situations that are presented to us here. For the wanderers, they cried to God, and he delivered them out of their distress. He led them by a straight way out of the desert. He led them into a city to dwell in. You know, this can be the testimony of every one of us who has believed in Christ and been born again. Some of us have wandered more than others before coming to know his mercy and his love. But when God does reveal to you your sinful state and you recognize the gravity of that, you can't help but praise God for his great mercy and grace and redemption as he saves you. This reminds me of a testimony that we heard at the youth conference we went to a couple of weeks ago. There was a man named John, and he got up and he shared his testimony with us. He had gone gone through high school and college and all of his growing up years, never attending church. He didn't even know a lot of people who attended church. He said, really, the only encounters he had with Christians were when he would try to debate them and uh, knock down their views of Christ and their Christianity. He was a hardened atheist by the time he was done with college. He was working as a paralegal in California, and he said, as all good stories go, I met a girl. And he met a girl who would eventually become his wife, and they started dating, and it wasn't long before he found out she was a Christian, and he realized this was not going to work. But she asked him to go to church, and so he said, I've done crazier things for a girl, and so he went to church, and he listened to the message. He talked with the pastor afterwards. The pastor gave him some apologetics material and a Bible, and then her parents gave him a Bible, and he said between reading the Bible and this apologetics material, his atheistic worldview slowly crumbled, and he began to realize what he had been missing all along. The whole purpose of life was that he had been created by a God who loved him and cared for him. And so he became a Christian. And he realized all this while in his life, he'd been wandering. He'd been starving and thirsty for real answers. And he found them in Christ, the bread of life and the living water. Perhaps you can relate your testimony to something like this. Perhaps you feel as though you're wandering even right now. Maybe there's some of you here today who feel like, ah, you know what, I'm not really sure where I stand with God. I would encourage you, Romans 10, 9 says, if you cry out, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And so cry out to God for his redemption. If you feel like you're simply wandering through life, cry out to him today. 
He will redeem you. He'll bring you into a city to dwell in. That's what it says here. He brings them into a city to dwell in, into a church where you can be fed with the word of God, into a church where you grow in communion with other believers, into the city eternal that's described in Revelation where the glory of God is its light. There's no need for a sun or moon. Wow. And he'd be seated at the banquet table with Christ himself. And so cry out to God. He will bring you from lowly and lacking to lavished blessing. The next scenario we see here is the imprisoned ones who cry out to God and he redeems them. First, we do need to recognize their situation is one that is self-inflicted. It's their own rebellion and spurning of God's wisdom that's put them there. And I tend to think of Adam and Eve when I think of this situation. Now, these particular events aren't tied to actual scriptural events that happen. I think it's just the psalmist giving a general description of hardships that can befall believers. But um, I think of Adam and Eve in this. You know, they rebelled against God by eating the forbidden fruit. And God then had to bring them down with hard labor, right? That's exactly what we see here. He bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. What was his punishment to Adam and to Eve? You're going to have pain in childbearing. You're going to have a hard time making a living. It's not going to be easy. That's precisely what we're seeing here. And so the weight of our sin and the difficulty of a life of labor can lead us to cry out to God. And I would encourage you, if you're feeling that today. Cry out to God. Let him deliver you from your sin and from the bonds that are there on you. You know, I think of um, a man that I know who actually stated this quite well. His testimony goes something like this, that he was uh, struggling with a particular sin that was destroying his life. And when he had almost nothing left, He finally called out to God, and he said it was as if the prison doors were opened, and he was able to walk out into freedom in Christ. The third picture that we see here is one of those who are afflicted, who are sick. And this refers to health issues, of course, and um, When we think of self-inflicted health issues, as we see here, because of their iniquities, they've suffered affliction. I tend to think of the first thing that comes to mind for me is is maybe like a drug addict or an alcoholic who is stuck in this pattern of sin and they just can't get out of it, realizing it doesn't fill the void in their life. It doesn't help them in any way. In fact, it's hurting them and killing them. But yet, for some reason, they're so entrenched in it, they just can't break free. And it says here that, yes, even those who are stuck in their own affliction can be redeemed by God. When they cry out to him in their trouble, and he delivers them from their distress. It says God sends out his word and heals them and delivers them from their destruction. And, you know, there's other sickness that God delivers us from as well. Sickness that isn't necessarily brought on by our own sin. We don't have to look too far than just to look at our own pastor and the sickness that God brought him out of five years ago when he was at death's door. And so we see that God does deliver, and he brings us out, and he redeems us from even those sicknesses as well. There's no place where God can't redeem his people. And so if you're struggling today with sickness or you're struggling with affliction, pain, cry out to God. He wants to redeem you. He wants to pull you up out of the pit. Lastly, we have again this example of the sea. The sailors who rely on their skill and ability and they have confidence and yet they're faced with the mighty power of God. And I've heard it said that in the ancient days, they used to say, if you want to, wanted to know the power of God, you go to sea, right? Because you're going to experience the power of God. 
I was talking with Pastor Chuck about this yesterday morning, and he said, you know, this reminds me of the story of John Newton, this um, account here in the psalm. And John Newton was a sailor, and uh, he was a hardened man, hardened young man. He was crass, and he was harsh, and nobody liked him. In fact, the, the more I looked into his story, he was actually sold off as a slave in a foreign country by his own crew, like his own crewmates sold him off as a slave because they didn't like him. He eventually got freed and was on a ship on his way back to England. And the ship was going through this terrible storm, very similar to this one here, the waves mounting up to heaven and then crashing down to the depths, feeling like there's just no hope. There's no way we're going to make it through this storm. And yet John Newton, this hardened anti-God sailor, who nobody liked, cried out to God for mercy. He prayed to God on that trip, during that storm, for mercy. God ended up saving him because of that. The ship made it through the storm. They landed in Ireland and uh, were able to limp into a port there. And John Newton became a Christian through that experience, crying out to God, realizing all of his skill, all of his ability as a sailor wasn't good enough. It wasn't going to save him. Even in the situation for, he was, for which he was most equipped, he was weak. And so he called out to God in his weakness for strength. And God saved him. And so I think for us, perhaps some of us, have come to Christ in a similar way. Maybe a, a storm came along in your life, a storm of some kind that disrupted your own life of self-reliance and made you say, wait a minute, I need God. And that's how you became a Christian. Maybe for some of us, it's a storm that you're going through right now that you haven't entrusted to God and said, Lord, I recognize this is your power. This isn't something I can control. Help me, God. Save me from this distress. Try to think of things that might be a storm in our lives, just thinking of uh, just our work, right? Perhaps you get a new boss or a new coworker who is changing protocols and changing things, and all of a sudden things are different, and, they're, and it seems like maybe they're even picking on you a little bit. And you start to think, boy, what's going on here? Maybe you're a student, all you young people, and you're doing your very best to get the best grade you can in a certain class. And for some reason, no matter how well you do your work, it just seems like this teacher just doesn't like your work. And you just can't get the grades you want to get. Perhaps for some of you, it's just the simple, everyday life things of living day to day on a, on a tight budget and watching expense after expense come in and, and thinking, boy, you know, well, next month we'll be able to put a little money in savings. Oh, and then another car repair comes and another home repair comes and another issue comes along. How do you keep above water? Maybe it's that kind of storm you're experiencing. Whatever God may be doing to show you his power and your weakness, I would encourage you, cry out to him today. He wants to redeem you. He wants to save you and lift you up out of that pit. And so we see here, God not only can take prosperity and bring it to poverty and take people from the mountaintop to rock bottom, but he actually delights, he delights in bringing his children out of the barren wasteland and into lands of blessing. And he delights in bringing the lowly and lacking into a place of lavishing his love on them. And so thirdly, what is our response to be to this God who loves us so much? It's to do as Larry did, to let the redeemed of the Lord say so, to give him the praise and the glory for what he has done. You know, just going back to these testimonies that I referenced earlier, think about these men. John Noyes, who spoke at the conference, he travels around the country now speaking to groups about the changing power of God in his life. 
He offers answers to tough questions about the faith. He's become an apologist where he's studying constantly the scriptures and how best to defend them against the accusations of this world. So when people have tough questions about the faith, he can bring them solid answers. He especially focuses on talking to teens about the truth regarding suicide. He's saying, God brought me out of wandering in purposelessness. And you too can be redeemed to a life full of meaning and hope. And so he's bringing that message to people all over the world. John Noyes is redeemed and he is saying so. I think of John Newton, the ship captain that became a Christian after God delivered him uh, from that storm. And after captaining ships for several years after that, particularly in the slave trade, he became convicted that that was a sinful activity and that was something he shouldn't be involved in. And so he actually became a pastor and a songwriter, a hymn writer. In fact, that experience on the ship caused him to write the hymn Amazing Grace that we sing today. Another familiar hymn that he wrote that we sing here is Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. John Newton wrote over 280 hymns and pastored a church. Talk about giving thanks to the Lord. And John Newton was redeemed, and he's still saying so today as we sing his hymns. There's something refreshing about giving praise to God, is that it brings thankfulness and gratefulness to our hearts. And that's what we need as Christians is a heart of gratitude to our Savior. You know, I think it's fairly safe to say that here in America, uh, we have so much blessing right at our fingertips and so much um, excess that we have access to that sometimes it's very difficult for us to be grateful. We always want more. We always want the next best thing. And 91% of Americans say that they celebrate Thanksgiving. They say that it is a beneficial thing to be grateful and to appreciate the people that are around you and the things that you have. And these are good sentiments, but yet it still just kind of leaves that holiday remaining as a, a cheerful family gathering when you think of it that way. Because Thanksgiving, true Thanksgiving, requires an object, a someone who has provided you with the things that you're thankful for. And so... The majority of Americans, sadly, do as they did in Romans 1, where it describes why God pours out his wrath on the unrighteous. It says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so we see for us who've been redeemed, the command here is the opposite. We are to give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. I want to just bring about in some application here just a few ways that we can help to develop a grateful heart towards God for what he's done for us. The first thing is to remember and reflect. A reflecting heart is a grateful heart. A heart that looks back on where Christ has brought you out of, on the struggles that he's brought you through, and responds in thanksgiving and praise. Also, meditating on his goodness to us thinking about the times that he's provided for us, even in times of chastening. You know, we see he bowed their hearts down, right? He allowed them to be sick with affliction. Those things were to humble them, to bring them back to himself. Look at your life, reflect on your life and say, when has the Lord done this for me? And then praise him for it. Another way we can develop a grateful heart towards our God is to have purposeful conversations with fellow believers, um, just sharing testimonies of God's goodness. We had one today with Larry. 
These testimonies bring great encouragement, especially for those who are maybe in a stormy or desert place in their walk with God at that moment. And so have those conversations with fellow believers. Thirdly, most simply, lifting our voices in praise to God. As it is said here, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. The psalmist says it basically five times. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And then he says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. That's repeated four times. So five times we get an instruction from the psalmist to praise God. Part of that's probably because we forget to do that. And we need that reminder. We need to be reminded to praise God in all those circumstances. And Jesus tells us to give thanks to God seven times in his words. And Paul tells us 46 times to give thanks to God. We need to tell God truths about himself and his redemption for us. We need to tell him about how we would have been lost in the wilderness or stuck in our chains of sin without hope in our illnesses and weak and powerless in the storms of life if it wasn't for him. And John Piper put it this way. I showed a little video at youth group this, well, two weeks ago now. Um, as we talked about Thanksgiving, John Piper did a little short video on gratitude. Um, I'd highly recommend it. It's three minutes long. You can find it on YouTube. But he says it this way. He says, when the high spring of gratitude to God fails at the top of the mountain, soon all the pools of thankfulness dry up further down the mountain. In other words, when we fail to thank God for what he's done for us, we have a hard time being thankful for anything. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today to be thankful and to give that thanks to God for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to you, his children. And I want to encourage Grace Church to let the redeemed of Grace Church say so. Heavenly Father, as we go forward today, we ask that you would just help us to brim with thanksgiving, Lord, with praise for you and for your mighty redemption that you've given us, not only in saving our souls, but in bringing us out of the hard places in life. Lord, we thank you that we can count on you when we're going through struggles now, that the trials that we experience are simply going to deepen our faith, make us more steadfast. Lord, as we go forward today, we ask that you'd help us to um, just see all the blessings and goodness that you give to us, and then to share that with others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you would turn with me to our final hymn. Now thank we all our God. It's in your hymnal 556 or in the bulletin.
before the benediction, I just want to give you a quick announcement. Um, kids, we're asking you to stay up here just a little longer. That's high school on down. Stay up here just a little longer to receive some instructions for the Christmas program. Kathy's got some parts to hand out and things like that, so we're asking you to stay up here just a little longer after the service, get those parts from Kathy and some instructions, and then you can head down to the Christmas shop. And so, hear this benediction. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen.